So you've probably seen articles, new shows, all kinds of media aimed at trying to help you pick the right stocks. Uh, so we know now what a stock is, um, but the fact that you can own these doesn't necessarily tell you what you have to do in order to use these assets to save for your own retirement and your own goals, right? Uh, so how does all this financial market necessarily relate to you? How can you uh, potentially benefit from it? So we're going to take my favorite hypothetical scenario of the entire year. Uh, suppose you are you, right? So you are earning a paycheck and you want to save your money towards tough times, right? Buying a home or retirement. And you need to figure out how much to save and where to save it. So what will you do? figure that out, we have to talk a little bit about personal finance. Uh, honestly, I think this is one of the most important pieces, the most important things I can teach you in terms of actually impacting your life. Uh, so pay careful attention. Uh, this is something you could potentially start using immediately. So let me first talk about beating the market. Obviously, by the market, I mean the stock market here, right? So Suppose, I'm showing you this stock price chart over here. All right, so suppose that um, I show you this, and so you are, you know, a regular person with some cash, and you're thinking about um, whether, based on seeing this price chart, should you buy and hold the stock because it shows strong and persistent growth? Should you buy and sell the stock right afterwards because it's going to grow a little longer but then collapse? or if you have any shares, just sell it immediately because it's growing as far as it has and it's about to collapse. Huh? What do you think? Think to it. Think about an answer to yourself. Just a moment. Well, turns out you don't actually have to think very long because it's actually a trick question. Um, this is not a stock price chart. Uh, I generated this using um, a random number generator. Uh, but it looks very much like a stock price chart. Why is that? So let me tell you how I generated this. This is a random walk, right? So basically what this means is you start with some initial price today, say $1 per share. Then I'm going to flip a coin. And if it comes up heads, I'm going to add a dollar to the price tomorrow. If it comes up tails, I'm going to subtract, subtract a dollar. And that can seem like a very, very simple process, um, but it actually leads to charts that look like this, right? Charts that look like stock prices, uh, except it's totally random, right? There's no rhyme or reason to this. Uh, there is no ability to predict on a given day whether the price is going to go up or down because literally it is a coin flip, right? Uh, and yet there are people who take a look purely just looking at charts like this and actually try to make decisions about what to buy and what to sell just based on looking at the chart, right? These people are called technical analysts. I have no idea where the word technical comes from, um, but <laughs> this is clearly the least technical thing you can do. This is more like, I don't know, a Rorschach test. Um, so... Yes, essentially we do this and then we repeat over and over again, and that's going to produce stock price charts that look like this, right? Um, hypothetical stock price charts. Uh, and so these are all from my random number generator. These are a few examples of actual stock prices. Um, and I got these from the Bombay Stock Exchange, not the, not the New York Stock Exchange or any U.S. And I just happened to have this data on my hard drive, so it was easy for me to make. And you can see these actual stock prices move in a way that's very similar to those hypothetical stock prices that I showed you a moment ago. Now, this is the level of the stock price. Suppose we were to take these and then just look at the change um, on a given day uh, based on the level of the stock price today, you get something that looks like this. 
right? Now, maybe you can see a pattern in this that you can exploit, but I certainly cannot. And my computer can't either, at least not when I uh, do standard methods of testing for relationship here, right? This is like a flat line. This is basically telling you the level of the price today is in no way informative of the price tomorrow. And that is a characteristic of a random walk, right? It's like a coin flip. Based on a coin flip, it goes up or down. It doesn't really matter what it is today. And this is a general feature you are going to run into when you're trying to predict the success of a firm, right? Because the stock price is entirely based on people's perceptions of a firm's success. And of course, those are based on its actual success. Uh, so there is this book, uh, Daniel Kahneman. He won the Nobel Prize in Economics a few years ago. He's the only um, psychologist to win a Nobel Prize in Economics. That's because what he figured out about the way our brains work is extraordinarily important in understanding economics. Um, so one of his, uh, so he's a, in his book, he is citing the example of uh, this other book in the field of management consulting. So these, there are these folks who write books about uh, how, a, what makes a well-managed company and how you can recognize whether a company is well-managed. So this book, uh, Built to Last, they are looking at various aspects of corporate culture, strategy, management practices, and they're saying, oh, this is really what it takes to make a successful company. So if you do this, your company will be successful. And if you see a company doing this, then you can assume it will be successful. So um, they followed up. They basically took down the list of firms mentioned in this book, which was like a bestseller and everything, the built to last book. Uh, and then they tracked them in the future. They found that on average, these firms, at least among the ones that had survived, uh, the difference between their profitability and just a random sample of other firms, um, it's basically like there's no difference whatsoever, right? So you take the firms that they say are well managed, the firms that are poorly managed, and you know some years later, there's basically no difference. Uh, so clearly, even the so-called experts in the field of management have no idea how to predict success. So how does this matter for personal finance? It means that we are, since we are not very good at predicting success, oftentimes our attempts to predict success, our attempts to pick winning stocks are actually counterproductive because we really have no ability to predict winners. So there's this guy, Terry O'Dean, he's a finance professor at Berkeley, or he was at the time when this book was written, uh, and he used data on regular investors uh, decisions of whether to buy or sell stocks and so he is able to infer whether an investor is picking one stock over another um, based on whether they sell one stock and then buy another one all right and so based on those decisions he finds that every time an investor drops one stock in favor of another one he finds that had they not done that had they just hung on to the original stock they would have earned higher returns by about 3.2 percentage points per year which is colossal right remember the rule of 70 3.2 percentage points per year um that implies a doubling every what like 22 years something like that 22 23 um Closer to 23, I guess, 23 and a third. But um, so so that's a lot of money you're leaving on the table. So maybe instead of doing a lot of transactions, you would have been better off just hanging on to the shares in the first place, right? Just um, picking uh, a broad swath of stocks and hanging on to them for a while. Um, but first, you might ask yourself, why is this? Why is it that it's so hard to predict winners? Um, or rather, why is it so hard to figure out which stocks prices are going to increase in the near future? So let's think hypothetically. Suppose you are a regular investor and you read an article like this. So there's this article in The Economist about this firm in India. 
um, Apollo Tires. Uh, so this is a firm in an emerging market, and it's apparently really well run. They're running this very modern operation. Uh, and you think, okay, this, this company looks like it's going somewhere. Um, and maybe it is, right? Suppose this company really is well managed and it really is going somewhere. Well, so here's the thing. So if we're looking at the market for shares of Apollo, um, so the supply is fixed, right? The company has issued a certain number of shares and regardless of what it does, that number of shares is going to remain as is. Um, all that can change is the demand for those shares. Now, yeah, you saw this article, but the thing is, it's an article published in a widely read magazine, right? So everybody else has seen this as well. And so when other people see this, and you know, if based on that article, we all expect the price tomorrow to be, say, up at this dashed line over here, well, the fact that other people see this, they expect the price to be higher tomorrow, they're going to start buying shares, and there's going to be a lot of people doing this, so it's enough to actually raise demand, right? And it's going to keep raising demand until we get to the point where the expected price tomorrow um, equals the price today, or rather, to say it more properly, the price today is the expected price tomorrow, right? We all think that the price is going to rise tomorrow, and so we all buy. Uh, shares until the price tomorrow is the price today and vice versa. Then that's simply because um, there can't be any profits left on the table, right? Uh, so this implies that uh, the price today is actually uh, the best guess of the market of all of us together at what the price will be tomorrow. And so since it's already the best guess of masses, millions and millions of people, pooling their information, it implies that there really can't be anything left for you to do, right? The remainder must be just sort of random, right? And so this is called the efficient market hypothesis. The fact that the price today um, already incorporates all publicly available information about the prospects of a stock, right? And as I said, this implies that since it's already our best guess based on all of the publicly available information, you would have a very hard time improving on that. Uh, as an aside, so I actually um, do political economy, so I study political outcomes quite a bit. And so this a similar principle has been said to apply to uh, politics as well. So there are these things called predictive markets. Uh, and so these are places where you can go to bet um, or rather buy and sell shares in bets on different political outcomes. They're called betting exchanges. Uh, and so there is this betting exchange back um, when doing this was legal in the US, there is this firm in trade. Uh, and so basically uh, the in trade bets uh, on the eve of the election said that there was a two to one chance that Obama would be reelected. And the popular consensus at the time, um, I mean, there was like a few outfits like, you know, Nate Silver's 538 that uh, said differently, but um, sort of the hot take in much of the media was that Obama was actually going to lose his reelection. But the betting market said something very different. He was a two, and one, two to one favorite to win. Um, and in fact, he did win by sort of a crushing electoral <laughs> majority, right? Um, and now, this is not always the case. Like I said, this is the best available public information. The betting markets are not always right. Uh, most famously, they really screwed up in the 2016 election. They gave Hillary Clinton like fairly good odds um, in winning uh, in winning the 2016 election. That was wrong, but that was based on all of the available public information. Like basically, all of the forecasters. Um, had it wrong, and it was only a question of how wrong you were, like how much weight you gave to the incorrect outcome. We could also see this phenomenon in other elections. So most notably, um, I was actually watching these markets uh, during France's presidential election. Uh, so in 2017, France had an election. It was Emmanuel Macron uh, running against several other opponents. 
Um, and so you can see uh, really basically all the uncertainty in that election was in the first stage, like the, the primary election, because uh, it was expected that the, one of the candidates who was advantage, who would probably be advancing to the second stage had no chance of winning. Um, but you can see that was a very interesting lead up. So there was a terrorist attack in the lead up and people had thought that this was going to have a big impact on um, the election. Uh, it turns out, like, if you look at the betting market, so the blue here is Emmanuel Macron's um, implied probability of winning, uh, you can see there's almost no impact on the day of that. So basically, the betting markets did not think this was a very important event. Um, what was an important event, so you can see, oddly enough here, on the day, this is basically the day of the election, um, right around uh, sometime in the... I guess, I don't know if it was the morning, our time, the morning, their time, but um, at somewhere around this time, uh, there was a sizable increase in his probability. And then at the moment when the polls close and um, it was announced based on uh, a random sample of ballots, what the predicted outcome would be, there was a sizable jump in his chance of winning, right? And so a jump to be almost certain. Uh, and this is sort of what you'd expect, right? These markets are incorporating the available information as quickly as possible, right? Now, so this implies even on these, even in the case of these like events like elections, it's almost impossible to beat the market. However, there is one way to systematically beat the market, and that is to use non-publicly available information, right? If you have some hot tip from the CEO or somebody else working in a company that uh, there's going to be a really bad earnings report or something like that. Um, obviously, if you know that and nobody else does, then the price does not yet reflect that information. You can profit off of that. Um, there's a problem. That's called insider trading. and It is illegal, right? So this is the only known way to sort of systematically beat the market. Um, and yeah, you can go to prison for it. That's <laughs> um, That was the basis of the... Uh, investigation into Martha Stewart that ultimately landed her in prison. Now, uh, the degree of this insider information uh, and the passing of information that is undisclosed can actually be pretty remarkable. So there is this recent paper, um, well, it was recent at some point, <laughs> I guess it's not as recent as it used to be, uh, this paper on um, insider trading and classified information. So they are studying coups done by the CIA. Uh, so back during the Cold War, the CIA would sometimes decide that there are countries whose leadership had interests not in line with the United States. And so they would decide to just remove those people from power. Um, so for example, the, uh, the prime minister of Iran uh, during the 50s or the 60s or something, um, so his name was Mozadik, and he decided to nationalize the oil reserves, and that made uh, many people in the U.S. and in Europe very upset. And so the CIA decided to do a coup against him. And so what these folks are doing is looking at the day that the coup was authorized, right? Not the day the coup happened, not the day the coup was reported, but the day the coup was authorized. Now, of course... This authorization is secret, right? The coup does not work if you tell everyone you are doing a coup. You have to keep it very secret, um, top secret, classified information. Um, what they are doing is on the day that the coup is authorized, they're looking at the stock returns of companies that would stand to benefit from the coup. So for example, um, the oil companies who lost the reserves they had discovered after Mozadik nationalized the reserves, right? So these companies would stand to gain quite a bit if he's removed from power and somebody else came into power and returned the oil reserves to the firms that had um, invested in them. And they can see, as you can see here, this is looking at the stock price um, of companies like the Anglo-Iranian oil company, etc. And so the coup is authorized, it's still secret, and you can see stock prices start increasing, right? And so what does that imply? It implies that there is a uh, close connection between people at the very highest levels of power um, and these uh, 
uh, and people on Wall Street, right? And in fact, there was a very recent example of this. Um, uh, Carl Icahn, a well-known figure on Wall Street, had a very close. He has um, he's good friends with the president Donald Trump, and um, apparently, uh, the day before Donald Trump's steel and aluminum tariffs were announced. He sold a lot of shares he held in companies that use steel and aluminum as their inputs, and um, that made a lot of people very suspicious. I don't think it was, well, we don't really know if the FBI is investigating that or, um, or the, the SEC in particular is investigating that, the Securities and Exchange Commission. Um, but, uh, you know, what this implies, all of this implies, is that there are certain individuals who have uh, very... Um, very, I guess, like privileged information, access to privileged information that the rest of us do not. So again, like, this is a way to profit off of the market. It's an illegal way. It's uh, extremely unsavory, uh, especially when it's based on the outcomes of coups. Um, leaving that aside, so of course, like, yeah, even if the market is efficient, uh, inside information can let you beat the market. Um, there's also new evidence that the market is not perfectly efficient. It's true. So we have evidence that people have behavioral biases. Um, there's this phenomenon of long run predictability. So in the very long run, these uh, stock prices tend to, or rather price earnings ratios tend to revert to their mean. Um, and of course, there are these firms uh, in the past, like I think it was a Renaissance investment, the the, the firm that was uh, well, there are, there are several firms that have made enormous amounts of money based on using big data sets uh, to, 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 mine the, to mine stock prices and other forms of data and try to figure out like, you know, some tiny movements in the market that are systematic, right? So it's, it turns out the market is not perfectly efficient. Uh, but here's the thing, behavioral biases, uh, if that's what's driving the market to be inefficient, the problem is those biases are in our own brains. Uh, so the fact that your brain is biased uh, is not necessarily a good justification for your deciding how you can beat the market, right? Uh, long run predictability, that's true, but the long run in this case means like seven to 10 years. So it's actually a very, very long horizon. Again, it is not really good evidence for why you should be trading shares on a regular basis. Uh, and as for the big data thing, most of us don't have the kind of resources available to these these trading firms, um, right? This is, you have to be, um, to be a proper quant, you need to have access to a supercomputer and a, um, I don't think even a fiber optics cable is fast enough anymore. You need to actually use like drones, <laughs> um, networks of drones with Wi-Fi to be able to uh, get your trades in fast enough, right? So in other words, like there is basically no way that you sitting at your laptop can get rich quick, right? And so the sort of day trading that you as an individual could do is basically pointless. It's probably not going to help you. In fact, it's almost certainly going to hurt you. So to review all of that, basically um, in the short run, stocks are following sort of a random walk, right? Uh, and so there is this thing, the efficient market hypothesis that suggests um, the current stock price incorporates all of the available, uh, publicly available information. Now, of course, you can get around that using insider trading, but that's illegal. And in fact, the fact that the, the simple fact that there are people who have access to this is all the more reason why you should be leery of day trading because there are people with more information than you do, right? There are people who know, um, you know, government policy tomorrow, potentially. And if they are trading on the market, then you have no chance of beating them, right? Um, and, you know, the, the fact that there are these behavioral biases, et cetera, um, that will make the market occasionally not efficient, that will cause the efficient market hypothesis to break down, that's not really a good reason for you with your biased brain or me with my biased brain to try to beat the market. So then how do you actually make money in the stock market if you're not trying to beat it. So we're just going to take the fact, what we have learned, the fact that we cannot beat the market, and say, what is the natural conclusion? If, if the efficiency of the markets and the behavioral biases we hold make it impossible to transact, to trade shares in a way 
that's going to let us beat the market, that suggests we shouldn't try to trade shares, we should just hold them, right? So in other words, you want to hold a diversified portfolio, many, many different shares, ideally shares that are just representative of the economy as a whole. Um, one point I want to drive home especially is to never ever hold shares in your own employer. If your employer gives you shares as some kind of compensation scheme, sell them as quickly as possible and then buy shares um, that are more diverse. The reason for that is um, by having shares in your employer, you are basically putting your entire future into the hands of that employer. So imagine that you put all your savings into the shares of your employer and then your employer goes out of business. You have lost both your savings and your job, right? That's a really bad situation to be in, right? And for the same reason, you should avoid shares in companies that are like your employer, right? So you don't necessarily want to buy shares in your employer's competitor because there can be common shocks that will disrupt the entire sector, right? Um, it would be bad to, if you are a aluminum can producer, to own shares in the other aluminum can predict producer. Uh, it would have been bad if you had held shares in that other company on the day when the steel and aluminum tariffs came into place, right? Uh, regardless of which aluminum can producers shares you held, you would have been hurt. So instead hold uh, shares just sort of broadly across the market, right? Um, Part of the reason for that is, as I've said, you can't really predict the market. The other reason is that every time you trade shares, that has a cost, right? Any platform that you use is going to charge you a little bit of money for every transaction. So don't try to, don't, don't try to do that. One way you can hold a very diversified portfolio is to use a mutual fund. So a mutual fund is uh, an institution where you give them your money, so you'll have an account with the fund, and you put money into the account, and then there are these professionals that will basically buy shares on your behalf. Uh, some of these are actively managed funds, so they'll have some hotshot at the head who claims he or she, usually he, um, can predict the market. Uh, and of course, we have seen that that's nonsense, right? So the, the, I remember, um, many years ago my brother was really obsessed with this mutual fund called the cgm focus fund uh and he was trying to convince me to buy shares in this uh and i just looked at the fund and noticed that it had a very very high expense ratio <laughs> um, the expense ratio of course is the amount of your money that the fund keeps to fund itself right and this is very high at funds that are run by these hotshots who claim to be able to predict the market, right? Because this is sort of their compensation for uh, whatever they do. And um, so I chose not to buy shares in the CGM Focus Fund. And then a few years later, basically the fund had gone out of business, right? And this is a common phenomenon. Like, as I said, it's hard to predict the market. And uh, so funds that do really well today will probably go out of business in 10 years, right? It's just hard to keep beating the market. Uh, so instead of buying, putting money into an actively managed fund, uh, what I have done, what most people do is put their money into index funds. These are funds that track an index, such as the S&P 500 or the Dow Jones Industrial Average or the NASDAQ, et cetera, these stock indexes. And so they make the minimal trades that they have to do to sort of match the price or the value of your shares in their mutual fund to make that track the value of the index that they are following, right? So one of the most prominent ones, the most well-known is called the Vanguard 500. This tries to track the S&P 500, right? And so you can see, uh, because this is a big fund that doesn't have, that tries as much as possible not to make transactions, um, its expense ratio is extremely low. So in an actively managed fund, expense ratios can be like two, 3%. Um, here it's like less than, you know, a fifth of a percent, right? Another thing to keep in mind is that there is a risk return trade-off. So assets that move around a lot, really risky ones, like, you know, emerging market stocks, um, one of the most risky assets you can think of, they will on a day-to-day -day basis have major movements in their prices. 
Um, but on average, you would expect them to grow a lot faster than other assets, right? That's the risk reward trade off. On the other hand, um, assets that don't move very much like treasury bills, as I've already said before, treasury bills are considered the safest asset ever, like they're considered the risk free asset, in fact, um, they're prices do not move very much on a day-to-day -day basis. And you can see here the short-term uh, short term treasury investment index fund. Um, its movements are basically, it's basically a flat line compared to this emerging market stock index, right? Um, but it's growing at a much slower rate, right? So they start at about the same amount, but are the same place and the emerging markets fund is a lot higher at the end of this, this horizon here. And that, as I said, is the risk reward trade off. And so you have to think about that when you are planning your investments, right? So, um, so my own investments, at least at the time when I made these slides, looked like this. So I had uh, a bunch of money in developing international stocks, um, some in like large cap and small cap US stocks, and, um, some in various like real estate funds, et cetera. Um, and that is largely, so you can see here, I have very little in bonds, which are the safest asset or the least risky one, um, and a lot in these much riskier other assets here. And the reason for that is that uh, you may not believe this, but I am still reasonably young. I'm only 32 years old and many years away from retiring. So I can have a very risky portfolio because I don't need the money very soon, right? My job is reasonably secure at the moment. We'll see what happens when tenure review comes up, but it's reasonably secure right now. And uh, so uh, I don't have to worry about having a large chunk of money living off of my assets in the near future. On the other hand, at the time when I'm about to retire, I'm pretty sure I would rebalance to be a lot more like this. So this blue is bonds. Since the bonds tend to not move around as much, it means that when I'm about to retire, I will know that having a huge chunk of my money in bonds means that I will have all of that money is probably going to be available for me to live off of, even if the money I have in shares is fluctuating a lot. So let me give you an example of what some of this can look like in practice. Uh, so, take the spreadsheet over here. So here I have the average daily uh, or rather average annual increase in several of these different uh, types of funds. And I'm assuming that every year, so suppose that back in 1976, you started spending what uh, $2,000, putting $2,000 towards your savings in real terms. So in real terms, um, you know, this is basically the same amount. It's just adjusted for inflation. And suppose, and, and this column over here is just tracking your, uh, the total value of your investment, assuming that it grew at whatever rate I put over here, right? And so had you put all of your money in the Vanguard 500 index, which came into existence in 1976, what would your return, at least based on the average returns, be today? Um, so let us just make another column over here with years. Paste the values over here. Right. All right. And so this is telling you, like, basically, just by investing two thousand dollars a year, right? Two thousand. That's um, that's less than two hundred dollars a month. Um, two thousand dollars a year in your savings account. Uh, you would have a little under $450,000 uh, in 2014, right? That's a decent retirement uh, package, right? It's not trivial. Um, well, suppose instead that uh, instead of putting my money into the Vanguard 500, I had put my money into, uh, let's say like bonds, right? Long-term bonds. 
what would I have had instead? So this long-term bond fund is um, is basically tracking the prices of corporate bonds. So it's riskier than treasury bonds, but way safer um, or less risky than um, than shares than stocks. Uh, so I can add this here. Not sure if I'm doing this correctly at all, but let's see what happens. <laughs> okay, there we go. Uh, and you can see there's a wide difference, right? Instead of having about four hundred fifty thousand dollars, you'd have a little over, uh, maybe close to about two hundred fifteen thousand dollars, right? So there's a big difference uh, in terms of your long run prospects, right? So on a day to day, this this figure is not showing you uh, the day to day fluctuations in what you would have earned. Um, but in the long run, you can see there's a big difference in what you would have gotten. And that difference is even bigger if you look at something like treasury bills, right? Uh, the treasury bills, instead of 450,000 or 215,000, you would have wound up with about 100,000. Um, one thing I would like to show you is suppose I had followed my brother. Well, okay, I wasn't alive in 1976, and I, <laughs> I don't know if this fund existed. But let's suppose that there are a fund like the CGM Focus Fund, which you know earned a return as the Focus Fund did, um, but had an expense ratio like this. So actually, the CGM Focus Fund, its uh, average return, overall return, was lower than um, the Vanguard 500, right? So that's, it actually was not doing that great over the period that existed, um, but it also had this huge expense ratio, right? And so had you used that instead, instead of having $450,000 as you would, had you put it just in the Vanguard 500 index or another stock index that you know, has a very low expense ratio, um, had you put it in this actively managed fund, you would have had 175,000. So this is even worse than putting it in the bond fund here because the bond fund has a very low expense ratio. So you could have had a safer and higher return by just putting your money in the bond fund as opposed to this actively managed fund, right? So uh, lesson here is, um, first of all, avoid funds with high expense ratios. That is a guaranteed cost that's going to lower your returns with probability one. Um, but also think about that risk reward trade-off. Um, making the wrong decision, being a little too safe in your long run bets can actually cost you a huge amount of money in the long run, all right? So a few other points that are useful to know as you're thinking about investing and saving. So taxes, you have to pay taxes on your returns. Um, so you have to pay taxes on dividends. So these are basically, we talked about this um, uh, previously. So when a company sells shares, uh, that's effectively a piece of ownership. And when the company makes profits, it has the option of returning some of those profits to its owners. Those are called dividends. When you get a dividend, you have to pay taxes on those. Um, you also have to pay taxes on realized capital gains. So basically if you buy a share at $100, and then you sell it at $200, you have made profits by simply holding that share. Those are called realized capital gains. So you earned $100 by um, selling those shares. And so you have to pay taxes on those at the time that you realize them. So at the time that you sell the, the stock and earn money. Um, and so in general, both, of, both dividends and realized capital gains are taxed at the rate of the capital gains tax, right? Uh, and so that rate has 
changed over the years. Um, but uh, whatever it is, it's generally been positive. And so you would have to report this income to the IRS and pay taxes on it. Uh, so the reason I mentioned this is that in order to give people an incentive to save for their own retirement, the government has created several tax advantaged retirement accounts. Uh, so there are a few individual ones called the individual retirement account and the Roth IRA, um, the Roth individual retirement account. The difference between these is whether you pay, whether it is tax advantaged uh, on the money that you put in versus the money that you take out, right? So with an individual retirement account, an IRA, uh, any money that you put in is not taxable. So if you if your paycheck is a thousand dollars and you put two hundred dollars into your IRA, uh, from the government's perspective, it's as though you only earned eight hundred dollars, and so you'd only pay taxes on eight hundred dollars. The two hundred dollars that you put in is totally tax free until the point when you withdraw the money. So then, when you withdraw the money many years in the future, it counts as just uh, you know like income. It's taxed at that rate, and so you would have to pay taxes on it at that point. Um, the Roth IRA is a little different. So the Roth IRA, you pay taxes. So if you put $200 of your $1,000 paycheck into a Roth IRA, you'd still pay taxes on $1,000 worth of income. But at the time that you take the money out, it is tax free, right? So the Roth IRA um, is going to save you, ta save you paying taxes on whatever you take out at the end. And so why would you pick a Roth IRA over an a normal IRA, I think it's going to depend heavily on your age. And um, so right now, if you are putting money into a retirement account, you definitely want to put it into the Roth IRA and not the individual retirement account, because whatever money you're earning as a student is probably a lot lower than uh, what it will be in the future when you are taking money out, especially if you're quite young, right? If you're 18 years old, you put $1,000 into your Roth IRA, that's going to be worth like many times more than that in the future. And so would you rather pay taxes on the $1,000 you put in right now or on the, say, like, I don't know, $10,000 that it becomes 50 years from now? right that's not a very hard question to answer um so on the other hand if you are at the highest income say you're you know 20 30 years from now you are making like a million dollars a year you're a ceo um and then you're planning to retire in just a few years then maybe the uh putting money into the the ira makes sense right uh there are also a bunch of employer provider plans so you've probably heard of a 401k um, that is an employer provided plan that basically means it's like an ira in that the money you put in is uh is not taxed. Um, it's only different that your employer manages it and usually your employer matches your contribution to some extent. Um, uh, 403B is the equivalent if you work for a, you know, a government or a nonprofit. So I have a 403B, not a 401k. Um, and then now we have these very new instruments, the Roth 401k, the Roth 403B, I mean, very new meaning like, you know, in the past 10 years or something, uh, they are sort of the, uh, 401k and 403b equivalent of sort of the Roth IRA. One other thing, so once you graduate from UCSC and you go on to spectacular things, um, perhaps you will be uh, a high paid executive at a uh, Silicon Valley IT firm or in some kind of hotshot accounting firm, uh, and you may be offered stock options as part of your compensation package. So it would be useful to you to know what a uh, stock option is, right? Um, a stock option, as its name implies, is the option to buy shares in a company at a prearranged price. So for example, suppose you start working at Google and Google tells you that we are going to, as part of your package, give you the option, a stock option on 100 shares of our stock. Um, and so whenever you choose to exercise this option, whenever you choose to use it, you can buy 100 shares of Google at $50 a share, regardless of what the price is at the time that you exercise the option. And so they set an expiry date on it five years from now. What that means is you have five years during which you can choose to exercise that option. And so why is this useful? Uh, so it means that uh, if they give you the option today and, you know, 
three years from now, the price of Google rises to be like, you know, $500 a share, um, then the fact that you can buy shares at $50 per share means you can just buy 100 shares, $50 per share, right? Um, so $5,000 and then turn around and sell those same shares at $500 per share, right? That's the beauty of an option. Uh, and so why do people like options instead of just giving people shares? The reason is the option hedges you against risk, right? So um, if the shares basically become, you know, fall to zero, Google goes out of business, um, that option, you know, it's much better to not exercise the option than to have those shares. So that doesn't make much sense in terms of a compensation package, but suppose you are sitting here deciding, do I wanna buy 100 shares of Google or do I wanna buy the option to buy 100 shares of Google at our current price? Um, the option will generally be a lot cheaper than the 100 shares themselves. And so it's a good hedge against risk because it means that you always can just not exercise the option. Whereas if you had bought the shares, you're sort of stuck, you paid for the shares, right? And so, as I said, it's often used as compensation. The reason is that uh, if you have a, a CEO or another high ranking executive, you wanna give them an incentive to improve the stock price of the company that they are leading. And so one way to do that is you give them shares, right? Or in, uh, stock options. And so now the better that they do, the more profit they generate for the company, the higher the, the share price rises and the more valuable their option becomes, right? Um, and you can also, uh, more relevant to you, right, when you graduate is if you end up working at a startup, sometimes they'll give you options uh, as an incentive to keep you on board with the firm, right? So you wanna stay at this firm because your option is only valid as long as you are an employee. All right, so that was a lot of material. So basically, uh, what is what did we learn? So a mutual fund is just a fund that buys shares for you. Um, an index fund is a type of mutual fund that does not try to actively manage the shares it holds. It just passively follows an index. And the reason why that is useful is because passively following an index is very cheap. It doesn't require a lot of transactions. And so index funds have very low expense ratios. Uh, and so you want to find funds with the lowest possible expense ratios because those are the ones that will, in general, have the highest net returns for you. Anytime you earn money from your share from your stock transactions, um, you have to pay taxes on the capital gains. And so, as I mentioned, there are these different retirement accounts that can help you um, basically minimize the amount of tax that you have to pay as you are saving for your retirement. And then an option is a contract that lets you buy a stock at a prearranged price up until a future date, right? And so this is a way of uh, hedging the risk that you would have to take had you just bought the stock rather than bought the option to buy the buy the stock, right? So what are our major takeaways? Um, so if you are planning for your retirement, what I would recommend is that you build a well-diversified portfolio, right? Um, maybe buying from index funds uh, to minimize your expense ratio. Um, so do not trade it very often. You should maybe occasionally, once every quarter, once every year, rebalance it in some way uh, to make sure you have as, much, as many risky and as many safe assets as you want. Um, and of course, never, ever, ever hold shares in your employer. Uh, take advantage of those retirement accounts. So look into the details of them and if, they make sense for you if you're earning an income now or expect to in the near future, make sure you know about those retirement accounts and take advantage of those. The government put those in place to help you make sure that you are the one using them as much as possible. Um, and last but not least, be really skeptical of anything you hear in the media about how to beat the market. It's very hard to beat the market. If it were easy to beat the market, then everyone would be doing it and everyone would be rich. And everyone is not rich. And so you can infer that it is not easy to beat the market. So some other sources you can consult. So this book, Random Walk Down Wall Street, is a classic. Um, it's quite old. I think he updates it every so often, but still it's, uh, it's just a really nice uh, explanation of why it's hard to beat the market and how you can do well. Um, I talked about Vanguard, so I put my money in Vanguard. A lot of people do. I think it's the largest 
or one of the largest uh, fund managers or one of the largest holders of index funds. Um, there are, of course, many other index funds that you could look into. I know BlackRock manages a few of them. Uh, probably uh, any kind of big manager of funds also has some index funds. So there are many options. You can look into the different uh, options and sort of choose between them. Uh, and so as of this writing, Yahoo Finance still exists. Um, I don't know how much longer that will be, but um, then that lets you do sort of a side by side comparison of stocks and funds and ETFs. And that can be useful if you're thinking about uh, what is a risk return trade off. All right. So happy trading. Um, make it as little trading as possible and good luck as you're saving for your retirement.